welcome uh, Malcolm Geit uh, uh, and you all. Thank you for joining me. Uh, one of the uh, most important Christian poets of our time was a recent thing that you you garnered. Uh, I, I read. And, uh, that's amazing. Uh, poem, I'm glad to you behind my bed. You know, that's why that's I do it. it is. It's it's obviously. The, I'll work on that. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll gain that someday. The uh, poet, musician, professor, Anglican. I uh, really appreciate you doing this. I think we've known each other now for about five years. The we have, yeah, I think we, uh, we met in your home state. And, uh, uh, yeah, I love having you at the house. And people still talk about uh, sitting and reading poetry. Uh, well, that's great. I was really impressed. I think you'd got an entire taco truck there yeah. just for us. I thought, yeah. wow, <laughs> A food truck. That was There's a big, big sort of refrigerated things of cold beer yeah. and, like, Unlimited free tackers. What's right. that like? That's right. It wasn't that bad. Hopefully, uh, you'll be you'll come back. It was. I know you've been with our friends in Dallas uh, uh, not long ago, and so it's always good to have you. Listen, I've enjoyed. I, I you know traveled through Lent with you this year. Uh, I love to read your poetry. Um, it's something I find uh, as I grow older. Uh, I love more. Um, uh, my parents instilled it in me, actually. Um, and I think probably went through that time period as a kid when I thought poetry was something I was supposed to like, but I wasn't really sure about it. But I think um, as an artist, and um, the more I pray, the, the more it becomes just a... Well, that's right. I mean, poetry works on sort of slow release, doesn't it? You know, yeah. you kind of lay it down at some early age and then suddenly it starts to kind of take effect and you know that's one of the greatest gifts your parents could have given you even if there might have been a period where you balked against it to have it instilled in you early that there's this beautiful thing which is available to you anytime any place that's a gift that keeps giving i was no it was really good and uh, they're both have died now and i've got their their books of poetry um unfortunately i do also have my father's love poems and not not quite uh, the poetry that instills much in anybody other than kind of a mm, yes it was the sixties, <laughs> but it's kind of a wonderful thing to have. I really enjoyed the spell in the library. So doing this with you is uh, fun, and and that um, I wanted to kind of touch on George yeah. McDonald. Who you? Well, this is this is the library. The spell's happening, as it were. So. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned George McDonald. Uh, yeah, that was the very first one I think I. I Right. I took down from the shelf McDonald's England's Antiphon because it's right. such an extraordinary book. No, I didn't even know of that book. Uh, and uh, But I loved how <laughs> planned or unplanned you read, you know, when we read Rejoicingly, the song speech of one of our brethren and, and went on. And, I, and, and of course, as I invited you to this conversation, th that part of what really excited me about it was um, some conversation I'm having with a friend, uh, Jim Hollis, who's a Jungian analyst, and talking about what a collective event this is. Oh, yeah. And the McDonald poem really kind of captures the idea of lifting, how poetry might lift ourselves out yeah. of the event or transform the or, event. Or transfigure it. I mean, one of the ideas in that book, England's Antiphon, and in fact, in the passage I read you, I mean, Antiphon, as you know, is when you sing something antiphonally, like when you do the Psalms antiphonally, like one side sings one verse. It's all one poem, one, si one yeah. side sings one verse, and the other almost seems to hear it and answer it, and it comes back. So there's a kind of sung um, dialogue. And I've been thinking that more and more, that, you know, because you know how the Psalms are, sometimes you're singing, singing really dark verses, but sometimes a dark verse is answered by a kind of light verse. Mm -hmm. And actually, if we are to agree with MacDonald that, the, the very body of poetry itself is not a big stodgy thing you work your way through. Right. But it's much more like entering into this beautiful airy choir and catching the voices, mm. crossing and recrossing across the times, and then maybe joining in. Mm. And um, I'm feeling, as it were, the antiphonal character of poetry now. The way certain poems that I've always known suddenly come to me from across the other side of the chapel of time, as it were, and speak to me. And um, obviously that's partly because the guys that were writing there, and all the girls, were, you know, this, is, this, this particular 
This may be a novel coronavirus in the sense that it's a new variation of a virus. But it's not the first time our lives have been completely set on hold by plague. And it's not the first time, and particularly those great poets, John Donne and George Herbert, were people who lived through that stuff and know about it, you know. I mean, John Donne stayed in London when everybody else was getting out of there right. to look at his parishioners. And that's when he wrote, you know, do not send to us for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for every man, it tolls for thee. Any man's death diminishes me. I'm involved in humanity, you know. That's, that came out of that experience of our connectedness. And out of the very same experience came <clears throat> that astonishing poem, him to God, my God, in my sickness. Right, right. In which you may remember, I mean, that has the most beautiful opening. And again, it actually picks up this idea of the antiphonal or the choir. You remember it begins, Since I am coming to that holy room, where with thy choir of saints forevermore, I shall be made thy music. I tune my instrument here, at the door and what I must do then practice before we words that effect. Mm -hmm. So it suddenly introduces this idea that we are going to become God's music. And in a sense, life is tuning up. You know, I'm just trying to tune up and get this thing ready. And then, then he changes the, the meter and the tone. And he's very frank about how unpleasant it is. Right. He compares yeah. himself, yeah. he's lying there with the doctors coming to sort of, and he compares himself to like a flat map. And he says, Is my physicians have grown cosmographers and all about that. But you know, then he says, Okay, well, I, he actually had a bad prognosis. You know, they basically told him you can get this poem that he was going to die of a fever. So it's that COVID, you know, high temperature. And um, and then he he in his idea of the flat map, it's like he's traveled from the east and the beginning of life and Oh dear, the sun's going down on him. He's, you know, southwest. He's going to come to the west edge of the map. And that'll be it. Curtains for John Donne. <laughs> but of course, then comes the fabulous turn in that poem. But he says, as east and west, in all flat maps are one, and I am one, so death doth touch the resurrection. It's amazing. So he suddenly says, Look, a flat map isn't the reality. Actually, the world is a globe, it's round. And the thing you thought was at the furthest end that way is that line is actually the same line bent round this. And it's almost as though it introduces, there's this other dimension to our life, completely other dimension to our life. And we don't have to take, you know, we don't, the measurements and the projection that we're on now are not the total picture. So I get great strength in this COVID, because, you know, I'm facing, you know, as another, you know, Latin poet said, you know, Timor mortis conturbat me, you know, the fear of death contur dis disturbs me. Of course it does. I wouldn't be human if it didn't. So his poem is adequate to that, but it doesn't lose hope. And I, I, I find him, you know, just to pick one. I mean, another poet uh, who, whose work I know extremely well and about whom I wrote a sort of big chunky book. Uh, nevertheless, and, and I always said he's a prophetic poet uh, and that's Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And of course, um, I'm not the only one here. Lots of, lots of people, because his poem, you know, The Ancient Mariner is extremely well known in England still, thanks be to God. Yeah, yeah. So people are going like, alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a one took pity on my soul in agony. Or well, that sense of stuckness and idleness, you know, day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. <laughs> Thanks for saying that, you know, I know how you feel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing that, you know, we've spent some time in the last three, let's say three or four, I mean, we could pick any decade. In the three or four decades, I mean, we really have bumped along without having, in the Western part, in that kind of weird part of the world, that Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic part of the world, right? That weird part of the world. We've kind of bumped along of believing that we were masters of our own destiny in some way, and that yeah. God could be distant. And I think there's, one of the things I'm curious about is that, um, and it's certainly this, you know, the, your, your life's work in some way uh, really is metaphysical. 
And it's in these moments, and part of the reason why I think Dunn, for instance, out of his own illness speaks to us, or Coleridge in that moment, or even Dylan Thomas, Death Hath No Dominion, right? Like these, yeah. all of these pieces speak to us because these, all of a sudden they're the words of transcendence, the metaphysical type yeah. of theology and deep spirituality we need to hear in a moment when our world of I'm the master of my own destiny comes crashing down. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think poetry is coming to our aid particularly at this point because one of the distinctive problems about this weird bit of the world, as it were, this weird little bubble in time where we've gone for the yeah. ultra-rational, the analytic, where we've reduced everything, if you like, to the flat map. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. The exactly. That's because we've, we've abased and marginalised the, all the gifts of imagination including the arts. We let the arts flourish, but they're just like this weird thing over there that's like yeah. some subjective little twiddly bit of life. But they've got nothing to do with the facts of life. But actually they've got everything to do with the facts of life. Mm -hmm. And they're the only instrument by which we discern quality rather than just quantity. So one of the things I think, uh, I hope, you know, as a sort of silver lining, uh, uh, that this COVID experience may think is, is actually reawaken us, not only to gentler ways of living on the earth, but actually to some sense that we got the wrong picture with just, by looking just out of the eye of reason. Uh, 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 uh. We need to open the eye of imagination and get the two things in focus. And that obviously poetry is the prime means of doing that. I'm wondering, I hadn't thought about this when we talked, I want to get to your muse and talk about what you're writing right now, but before that, you know, one of the things that's happening right now is the, a large uh, body of uh, uh, people are getting concerned about hymnody, singing, singing yeah. choir singing. And I'm wondering, you know, as people look at uh, uh, having instrumentalists or having one chorister singing or some things like that, I wonder what gift poetry could have in liturgy at this moment for us. Um, and, and probably many people are, are uh, novice uh, readers of poetry, and but you know it's meant to be spoken. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, all my poetry is written to be spoken and to be breathed out loud, and I don't think it is a poem when it's on the flat page. I think it has to sort of shimmer into the air. But to talk about poetry and liturgy, I think the first thing to say is that at its best, a liturgy is a poem. Mm -hmm should be this shaped thing that kindles the imagination, brings you on a journey, takes you to another place and leaves you back changed and with new vision, which is what a poem does. At its best, liturgy should be a poem, but at its worst, <laughs> it's just a list or a kind of yeah, hymn sandwich. Right? Like, go through it all, we're gonna do this now. Then we you know, and um, as a, you know, I mean, you have to kind of get it from the to-do list or the to-say list into the poetry. Now, one way, of course, is to introduce poetry into it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'd be I mean, curious about, kind of, yeah. We kind of do that every time we use the Psalms anyway. Sure um, and some hymns are poems, not all of them, but some are. <laughs> but um, I do think we can bring poetry into it. I mean, my book, um, Sounding the Seasons, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which has been the kind of, in some respects, in terms of impact or spread or the use of these things, um, uh, poetry breathed into life as opposed to gathering dust on a shelf. That book, Sounding the Seasons, is probably mm -hmm. one of my most uh, well-known and used books. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a cycle of 70 sonnets for the Christian year. And I wrote it over the course of the Christian year. I wrote it in response to the liturgy, in response to the seasons, in response to the specially set gospels for Pentecost or for whichever day it was. And he, I wrote it, this is the really key thing about that book. It wasn't me being a little poet in the attic, you know, trying to say my peculiar things. Uh, yeah. It was me as if you like the bard of my tribe. It was me articulating for one church in Cambridge, for that particular church community, breathing into the air our common prayer. So I, there was a certain discipline to writing that that although in one sense I was drawing on personal experience, of course I had to do that for it to be real, I wasn't insisting on personal experience. I was making the particular, in some sense, universal and available, which is another thing I think that poetry and liturgy need to do. Yeah, yeah. And when I just had done, I, you know, I hadn't thought of it until you talked about the uh, antiphon nature of, of it uh, with... Um, and, and how poetry speaks to us in that way. And I was 
th of course, immediately thought of the Psalms, but I'm glad you reminded me of that. Psalms, yeah. yeah. So tell me, so I was thinking about, um, uh, as we were getting ready for this, um, uh, a Seamus uh, Haney's book, um, Haney's book, um, uh, poem, excuse me, uh, where he begins, between my finger and my thumb. My thumb, and, the squat pen rests. Well, I found, you know, you can actually listen to him read this. I found uh, a oh, collection yeah. of him reading, which just changes the whole poem. Oh, but, he reads his poetry brilliantly. Yeah, it's... it's I mean, I've, I've been to quite a few of his live readings, and um, I've also had the great joy and privilege of sitting with him and talking and just having him recite things and, you know, engaging with him personally. And... Um, he just, he's transfigured himself when he reads, you know, mm -hmm. it's extraordinary. So this, mu so the muse is working in you. I've been amazed to watch all of this. Uh, uh, you've been very productive. Uh, yeah, it's rather taken me back. And I think it's been quite helpful. I didn't, I didn't sit down to make myself say, you know, which would have probably killed it all stone dead. I mean, there was now a- all right on the pandemic. Yeah, there was a kind of meme going around very early in the pandemic, which said like, oh, well, when the plague came to London, you know, Shakespeare went home and wrote King Lear, you know, like, no pressure then. 